I was seated at my desk, enjoying the mid-morning coffee my assistant had brought me. Although she used artificial sweetener, I had jokingly threatened to switch to black tea instead. My thoughts were consumed with a pressing copyright issue that needed a swift resolution. But the federal government was dragging its feet on releasing essential documents. Their typical sluggish pace was making it nearly impossible to accomplish anything. Federal employees seemed incredibly inept, avoiding responsibility unless given direct orders. I couldn't help but wonder how many hands a letter passed through before any action was taken. I was stuck, unable to move on to my next project, facing potential financial losses if items had to be scrapped. The rise of bureaucratic red tape had complicated straightforward matters, even altering job titles. I felt too old for this nonsense. There's a young woman here to see you, said Tom, stepping into my office. She wouldn't give her name, but handed me this photo. As I looked at the picture, a sense of dread washed over me. Good grief, I thought. Why now? It was a photo of Lisa, my ex-wife, and me on our wedding day, taken 18 years ago. It brought back memories of pain, betrayal, and tears. People assumed I had come back to heal, and they were right. Back then, I didn't understand money or power, but I had learned a lot since then. Ask her if she's Emily or Emma, I said handing Tom a USB drive in a Ziploc bag. If she is, show her the video on this. If she wants a copy, give her everything and return the original to me. Come back afterward and I'll answer your questions. At 42, I had fully embraced singlehood. My brief marriage to Lisa Marie Thompson had shattered my trust, and now people had to earn it, which was no easy feat. I stood 64 with a 38-inch waist weighing 200 pounds. I hit the gym for two hours after work. My dark brown hair was starting to gray, and I still turned heads. I had a few casual relationships, but marriage and love were not on my radar. About an hour later, Tom returned, leaving the door ajar. He explained that the young woman still had many questions. She sat down, her serious expression showing she wouldn't leave without answers. Her emerald eyes looked at me expectantly. Do you know which one it was? I asked. Emma, he replied. Who is she and why was she so upset? She cried saying we've been lied to all our lives. If my heart's right, he was lied to as well. Emma is one of a pair of identical twins. The clip you saw was her mother's last words to me before our first divorce hearing, seven months before the twins were born. I found out about them through friends and wasn't informed she was pregnant. The rest of the items on the stick detail what would happen if I contacted them. Her father, then with the CIA, got me fired from the FBI with false charges because he hated me. The documents imply there's a contract on my life if I interfere with them. He was a powerful, dangerous man. She divorced me to marry my former best friend, with whom she'd been having an affair for months. As far as I know, he's their biological father. How did she find me and what does she want? Emma found an old picture in their attic with your name on it, googled you, and recognized you. She also found the original marriage certificate and divorce papers. She tracked you down through Facebook and other online searches. She came to find a bone marrow match for her twin sister, who is running out of time. Why come to me? I'm not their father. It doesn't make sense, I replied. Her mother was with her father months before I knew her. Her father ensured that. Emma suspected something and convinced doctors to run a DNA test during the bone marrow test. Mr. Thompson isn't their biological father. What do you think? Tom's face broke into a big smile as tears welled up in my eyes. If Emma was right, it meant my ex had lied to me all those years ago. I wondered if I might be their father. I knew she was related to you the moment I saw her, Tom said, standing up. She has a look that makes it clear. Are you ready for perhaps the biggest shock in years? Tom, send the information on the stick to my publishers. Tell them to release it in a way that can't be traced back to me and not to disclose my writing name because my life might still be at risk. Stress that it needs to be made public quickly. Then find someone to do a fast DNA test and set up an appointment. If I am their father, I want proof when I confront their mother. 
If it's true, I need a litigation lawyer to fight for my parental rights. Clear my schedule. I need to go to Emily's hospital ASAP, I said. Now I've got to find Emma. Emma, come in and introduce yourself, Tom called. Emma walked in and the moment I saw her, I knew. She looked just like my younger sister at 16. I choked up, overwhelmed with emotion. Emma and I both started crying. Tom took a few pictures with his phone to capture this life-changing moment and then left us alone. Emma, you have an appointment for blood testing at one. They promised a rush job and I charged it to the corporate card, Tom said when he returned. I also arranged for you to meet your sister Barbara at cells at three and reserved a private table. Emma needs to see what we do. Barbara will make sure her kids are taken care of. She knows you have important family news. I stood there, overwhelmed and uncertain, watching Emma walk toward me. Questions flooded my mind. I hugged her tightly as Tom closed the door. It was surreal to think I might be a father. Emma seemed to feel the same way, trembling as we left my office. We decided to take things slow, figuring everything out step by step. After arranging for the clinic to email the report, we headed out for a late lunch. I found out that Emma had skipped school and driven all day until she had to rest at a station. I was furious about her risky decision but held my tongue, realizing I might be reacting like an overprotective dad. It also reminded me of something I might have done at her age. When we arrived at Cells, I spotted Barbara's car. I know we're here to meet your sister, but why did Tom set this up without consulting you first? Emma asked. You're about to see what Tom and I saw when we first met you, I replied. It will explain why we believe you and Emily are my daughters and why I was so shocked when the test came back positive. Can I call you dad? Emma asked. I laughed, a smile spreading across my face. I'd love that. Cells was a family-owned restaurant, a notch above Red Lobster with a stellar reputation. The owner and hostess led us straight to our private booth. I ordered a bottle of champagne and extra tissues. Barbara had her back to us, so I asked Emma to wait while I approached. Hi, sis. Thanks for coming, I said. Barbara looked up, curiosity in her eyes. You look happy. What's up, Barbara? Stand up. There's someone I want you to meet, I said as Emma walked over. This is Lisa's daughter, Emma. Barbara turned and stared as if she was seeing a younger version of herself. They had strikingly similar features, long brunette hair, high cheekbones, small ears, light blue eyes, and warm smiles. Oh my God, Barbara exclaimed. Paul, you should have given me a heads up. This is incredible. How long have you known about her? Barbara asked. About five hours, Emma said, her voice trembling. I surprised him at his office. Tom and Dad knew immediately. Seeing you, I understand why. The server returned with tissues and grasped why we needed privacy. Barbara, through tears, explained that three more people would join us, so the hostess moved us to a larger table. Barbara called her husband to join us and notified our parents to come quickly, calling it a family emergency. Mom asked what was wrong, but Barbara said she couldn't explain. We were all emotional. I received a text from Tom saying the publisher had released the information and it would be on the 600 News. We had just calmed down after our first glass of champagne when Barbara's husband and my parents arrived. I chuckled, hearing my dad's booming voice. There better be a good reason for this, he said. Barbara and I stood to greet them. Mom, Dad, Lou, I'd like you to meet Lisa's daughter, Emma, Barbara said proudly. My mother instantly recognized the resemblance and beamed with pride. She finally had the granddaughter she always wanted. My dad was stunned, uncharacteristically speechless. When he finally spoke, he said, I see it, but it's hard to believe. My mom sat beside Emma, holding her hand tightly, too emotional to speak. My dad ordered two more bottles of champagne, his pride unmistakable. After our glasses were refilled, I stood up with mine. I need to explain, I said as Emma started recording with my phone. I shared how we met and what had happened that day. My dad then stood up. Emma, we don't need a DNA test to confirm what we already know. Welcome to our family. You have two more aunts to meet soon. Promise us you'll always consider this family your home. Emma took the phone and spoke. I came here seeking the truth, not knowing what I'd find. Today has changed everything for Dad and me. We didn't know until now. Meeting Aunt Barbara showed me what unconditional love is. My twin sister Emily will feel the same. I scanned the table as everyone became emotional. 
Even my father, who rarely showed his emotions, had tears in his eyes. My mom held up two fingers, crying harder. I captured everyone's joyful tears before stopping the recording. Emma added her and her sister's info to my contacts and texted Emily, showing me the video she sent. Emma's message read, If what we think is true, the DNA test will confirm. Watch the 600 News. Love, your twin. Still in disbelief, my mother asked to see photos of Emily and Emma. Emma showed her pictures of the two of them. My mom demanded copies for her laptop, displaying them on the full screen for all to see. Emma then turned off her phone and put it back in her purse, making me realize no one knew where she was. My phone rang. It was Emily. I stood up and walked away to answer it. My dad noticed me tearing up and looked at me questioningly. Emma mouthed, It's my sister. My dad nodded, understanding, and I answered the call. Hello, this is Emily. After seeing the video, I had to call, she explained, and wouldn't be home until at least 700 p.m. because she was stopping by the police station for an update on Emma. I pretended to be clueless, even though the police had been here earlier and left their card. Any suggestions on what I should do? She asked. Get him to watch the 600 News and pay close attention to what's revealed about me, I advised. Tell him you'll talk when your parents aren't around and show him the video. Give him my number and ask him to text first before calling. Hell understand after watching the news, I replied. Once we have the DNA proof, Emma and I might bring the whole family into this. What do you mean? Emily asked after I explained Emma's actions to help. In the Johnson family, blood is thicker than water. If I'm not a match, someone else might be, I said with a chuckle. We are strangers after all, she said, still a bit skeptical. You'll see, I said laughing. Family sticks together. We chatted a bit more before saying goodbye, her voice relieved as she hung up. After ordering dinner, I gathered everyone to explain why Emma was here. Phones immediately buzzed with calls to spread the word and gather potential matches. My mother took charge of organizing everything. Emma, how did you get here? My father asked. I drove my old 1994 Voyager van. It's a step up from a rent-a-wreck, she laughed. It's in Dad's parking lot. Take that van to my dealership in the morning. You're not driving back in that. It's a miracle she made it here, my dad said firmly, reflecting on her youthful determination. What do you plan to give her, I asked. She can pick one out, he replied with a wink and a smile. If I could choose, it would be a 4X4. I love the outdoors, Emma said. My dad responded with a big grin. We all love the outdoors. He started reminiscing about the summer I learned to water ski and go barefoot, sharing stories as if he was holding court. Both my parents insisted that Emma stay with them for the night, agreeing it wouldn't look right for us to be alone. After dinner, Dad drove them to her vehicle and then drove it home. My mother was thrilled, already planning to spoil her new granddaughter. Dad ended up waiting until 100 a.m. for them to get home. Around 1,000 p.m., the police investigator called me. It took him two hours to complete a background check on me. The media was buzzing with questions about the information I had released. We discussed the situation and related issues. Seeing the three generations in the video had answered many of his questions. I told him we were rushing DNA tests to confirm our relationship and that Emma was with my parents. Once confirmed, we would return to see if I could be a match for Emily. I asked him to buy us some time and promised to update him on our progress. Emily later told me he reported back to her about our discussion. I was confronting my past again, but with a new perspective. This time, I wouldn't be intimidated by my ex-wife's family's power and money. I would use the media, the courts, and the truth to my advantage. I had the resources, the proof, and a growing determination. I didn't seek revenge, just justice through the truth. The next morning I was in my office, ensuring any schedule changes wouldn't affect me much and setting up tasks for Tom while I was gone. Tom kept checking the email accounts like an overprotective parent, questioning me about my day and extracting all the details he could. To be honest, I never tired of looking at Tom in his youth. He must have been every teenager's dream. His naturally styled brown hair accentuated his soft features, and his piercing emerald green eyes and full lips were still captivating. 
As a single man, I often admired him but was thankful he never caught me looking. Finally, he received the DNA test results, printed them, and exclaimed, It's confirmed you are her father. Tom immediately called the lab to send the information to Emily's specialist and began searching for the toughest litigation lawyer in New York. After vetting a few, he selected the best and arranged a video call. The lawyer agreed to work on a percentage basis, confident it was a slam dunk. With the DNA proof, we would go after my ex-wife, her husband, and her parents for denying me my parental rights. The restrictive court order against me would be squashed, proving their deliberate actions. The supposed contract on my life, even if not factual, would demonstrate their attempts to intimidate and control. The lawyer saw the potential for a significant case, even before involving the government. I told Tom to send a gray dust-covered box from the safe to my new lawyer. It contained legal proof that my ex-wife's father had tried to destroy my career and marriage. It had taken years to collect this evidence through various government levels. I later learned that the police officer had released the video, turning the story into a runaway daughter, finding her biological dad to save her sister's life, causing a media frenzy. It's confirmed, I said on the phone, my voice trembling with emotion. I'm a father, twice over, thank God. Be ready to leave tomorrow at 700 a.m. from the dealership. Ill spread the word. Have you called your daughters? Mom asked. We were now driving a nearly new, fully loaded Ford Explorer to Ego, New York. Emma and I led the caravan, my parents following in a tour bus with 33 other vehicles behind them. The entire family convoy was moving when my phone rang. Emma answered and put it on speaker. You're being tracked by CNN, Emily said after our greetings. There's a tour bus with a banner saying, the Johnsons are coming. One out of 141 should be a match. We've got the DNA test proving he's our father, and I have a new Ford Explorer, Emma replied. Dad said if it was confirmed, a lot of family would come, but I never imagined this. This has given me hope I never thought possible. I can't remember feeling this good. Dad's family spread the word, and people came out of nowhere. I met so many relatives this morning. It will take several meetings to remember all their names. I met first, second, and even third cousins. I'm so proud I want to change my last name to Johnson, Emily stated. I never knew families like this existed. I was so overwhelmed I nearly crashed. That's when I decided to write this incredible experience into my next book. My daughters were still discussing Emma's experiences when Emily said she had to go her mother had just entered the room. Dad, are you okay? Emma asked, concerned. I saw you get very emotional. How do you expect me to feel? I discovered I have two daughters raised by my ex-wife and a former friend without my knowledge. One is vibrant and full of life, the other is on the verge of dying. One is so strong and independent she moved mountains without thinking, just like I would, and she wants to take my name, I replied with pride, my voice breaking. I was so focused on saving my sister's life I didn't think about the impact on you. I wasn't a good match because I inherited a defective gene from our mother. The emotional turmoil I've caused will be felt for days. Can you forgive me? Emma asked. For what? Coming into my life and turning everything upside down? No, that's what living is about. You've given everyone another person to love. You've given me a chance to be a real dad, I said through tears. Your grandparents adore you. My mother is so proud. Seeing her face in you means everything. You and your sister have become her favorites by birthright. She's been spoiling us. We went shopping, and if she bought me something, she got one for Emily, too. She laughed, saying she had years of spoiling to catch up on, Emma said. That's Mom. You'll find it impossible to distance her from you. I know I've tried, I said. Barbara and my sisters will brag about this for weeks. By the end, this will become a family legend shared for years. We learned that as soon as Lisa saw the live news feed about our arrival, she began having severe panic attacks. The walls she had built were crumbling. Emily, feeling strong and determined, confronted her as soon as she turned off her phone. Mom, why did you hide the truth about our real dad? Emily demanded. When she got no answer, she pressed harder. You hid the truth from us, made decisions about our lives. What gave you the right to play God? Even Dad didn't know. If Emma hadn't found out about him and sought the truth, would you have let me die? Lisa had no answers never expecting the truth to come out. 
Her father had hated me from the start and did everything to drive me away. Thankfully, Emily's doctor walked in at that moment. We received DNA from a man we didn't know, proving he is Emily's biological father. He is coming to be tested, and there's a good chance he's a bone marrow match. He should be here tomorrow afternoon, and for his protection, hell be under guard, the doctor said before leaving. Mom, my biological dad is coming with 140 others in case he's not a match. He wants to give me a fighting chance, Emily stated. He's risking his life to help me. Why? Lisa asked. To him and his family, blood is thicker than water. Though I'm a stranger to them, I am family, and family comes first, Emily replied. You had to know we look like our real dad's mother. Watch this video, it proves everything. Lisa watched the video of my family meeting Emma. There was no doubt three generations shared the same face. She could no longer deny the truth. Her daughters had proof, and her and her husband's actions were backfiring. Then a man appeared at Emily's room entrance asking for Lisa. When she admitted she was Lisa Thompson, he handed her a large legal envelope saying, You have been served. Lisa fell to her knees, sobbing. Emily, furious, felt no pity. Mom, why did Grandpa put a contract on my biological dad's life? Emily demanded, knowing she wouldn't get an answer. Arnold Franklin Thompson had just left a corporate meeting. As he walked down the hall, he was served with legal papers. He sat down in the reception area to read them. The first document was a lawsuit against him and his wife for denying me my legal rights as the father of my daughters. The second was against his in-laws and himself, accusing them of conspiring to ruin my marriage and career. It was clear I was seeking justice, demanding sole custody of my daughters. I argued that if Emma hadn't found me, things would have been different. He would never have known about them, he argued, accusing Sharon and Arnold of moral abandonment, implying they would have let Susan die to keep their secrets. Proving otherwise in court would be difficult, especially with the media spotlight. Arnold recalled when he and I were college roommates and football teammates. Both of us had pursued Sharon, but I had won her over. Arnold had even been my best man at our wedding. However, Sharon's father never approved of me because of my background. He convinced Arnold to pursue Sharon, and Arnold complied. With her father's influence, I was kept busy with FBI assignments, leaving Sharon and Arnold alone together. Eventually, Sharon and Arnold became lovers while I was on an undercover mission for two months. Her father had recorded their affair and confronted me with the evidence when I returned. Sharon, unaware she was pregnant, thought her missed periods were due to stress. Delighted, her father saw me file for divorce immediately. When the twins were born, they knew I was the father. But her father had already gotten me fired with false charges. It took me four years to clear my name, during which I left the area in disgrace. Meanwhile, Sharon and Arnold married and had two sons. The unedited tapes would prove the conspiracy between Sharon's father and Arnold to break up my marriage. Arnold now wondered how Sharon would react when this truth came out. Emma, the group and I arrived at our final stop of the night around 900 p.m., exhausted after 14 hours of driving. We ordered a light meal to our rooms and quickly fell asleep until the 500 a.m. wake-up call. Emma and I left early because I had a secret meeting with the police officer and an FBI representative. The rest of the group left at 700 a.m. for the six-hour drive. Emma dropped me off at the Ego Police Department, where I met Detective Peter Rogers and FBI agent Chad Gerido. We discussed my former father-in-law's questioning for over an hour and a half. I provided my lawyer's contact information and left a USB stick with all my evidence. I was placed under official protection until I left town. With a security escort, I was taken to the hospital for a blood draw to see if I could be a bone marrow match. As I approached Susan's private room, I heard Emma and Susan talking. The hospital staff recognized me by my pen name, and I signed a book for one of the nurses. I walked into Susan's room. Dad, Emma said in surprise, I didn't expect you so soon. Susan, this is our dad, Paul Johnson. Susan looked frail, her skin loose and her face reflecting the closeness of end of life. Despite this, her smile was wide and her eyes were bright with hope. Susan, they're rushing the test. It should be done in 30 minutes. The rest of the family is checking into their hotels. My parents are having their bone marrow drawn now and will meet you soon.
If there's more than one match, the doctor plans to do a double transplant simultaneously in both arms, I said, trying to keep my emotions in check. Susan broke down in tears. I sat on the edge of her bed and held her until she calmed down. Emma captured a photo of us both crying tears of joy and relief. She was glowing with pride, and rightly so. I realized how much she had done and was overwhelmed seeing my two daughters together for the first time. Grandma, Grandpa, come in and meet my sister, Emma said. The five of us talked for over an hour until Susan's doctor entered, smiling. My mother and I are perfect matches for Susan, Dr. Proctor announced. Are you ready to be checked in for surgery at 600 a.m. tomorrow? We both agreed. My dad whispered, Thank God we prayed for a miracle all the way up. Don't you need my parents' permission? Susan asked. Normally, yes, but we received a court order this morning thanks to Mr. Johnson. It allows us to proceed if he or a relative is a match. The judge agreed that your mother and her husband weren't putting your needs first, Dr. Proctor explained. Mr. Johnson will cover all costs not covered by insurance, Emma smiled. I'm not surprised, sis. With what Mom and Arnold did, Dad had no choice. Legally, he had no rights, so he used the courts to prevent any delay, Emma explained. A security guard then informed us we were about to be on national news. Susan turned the TV to CNN, which revealed my identity as the author of a popular book series worth an estimated 40 million. Emma, Susan, and the doctor were amazed. My parents looked at me in shock. They had no idea, thinking I was just an independent corporate financial advisor. My God, Dad, Susan said. I've read all your books. They're great, I laughed. After my former life was destroyed, I had to reinvent myself. Writing was my therapy. The first book's success was a turning point, and it grew from there. I keep my books current, exposing the raw truth about world situations, societal views, and morals, whether people like it or not. For the first time in 15 years, I checked into a hospital along with my mom. My new daughter wanted to share a room with me, but hospital security wouldn't allow it. Emma spent the evening running between three different rooms, ensuring everyone was settled and comfortable. My dad called some relatives to update them. Sharon and Arnold weren't pleased when they arrived after work. Their icy attitude was met with indifference. Susan informed them she was being prepped for surgery and would receive a double bone marrow transplant in the morning due to a court order. How? Sharon demanded. Mom, Arnold, my biological dad, and his mother are perfect matches. Both are donating so I can get a double dose and recover fully, Susan replied. Mom, do you know who Jason Blackstone is? He's your favorite author? Well, Jason Blackstone is a pen name for Paul Earl Johnson, my biological dad. Sharon and Arnold turned ghostly pale. They had hoped the court case would vanish, but Paul's net worth showed he wasn't after money. He wanted justice. Paul always believed in law and order, which made him a successful agent until his wrongful termination. Mom, did you know your father has been in FBI custody all day? You might want to check with Grandma to see if he's home. Can you explain why this is happening? Sandra and I want to know, Susan said with a big smile. Sandra is somewhere in the hospital, either in Dad's room or Grandma Johnson's if you want to see her. Sandra and I were in my hospital room discussing how she would handle her mother when Sharon found her. A security guard knocked and poked his head in. Mr. Johnson, do you know what Jackie... Yes, let her in, I interrupted. Jackie, my assistant for 10 years, walked in. I had supported her through her divorce after her husband got his assistant pregnant. She was now 35 and a single mother, still adjusting to single life, but still wearing her wedding diamond. My family and I adored her, and I often wondered why she hadn't found someone. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm here to do what I always do look after you. Dr. Proctor said you'd be here for at least three days and suspected you were a match. Your arm will take a week to heal enough for light activities. I booked a private jet and a hotel using the corporate card, Jackie explained. Sandra texted me, Dad, FYI, she loves you. She couldn't stay away. I raised my eyebrow. The guard poked his head in again. Sharon and Arnold Johnson want to see you. Will you allow them in? Only after they've been searched, Jackie insisted. What's your relationship with Mr. Johnson? The security officer asked. I'm his fiance. Didn't you see my ring? Jackie replied. Sandra winked at me and mouthed, told you. 
I laughed as Sharon and Arnold entered. Sandra spoke first. Dad, I wouldn't trust these two for a moment. They're just trying to cover their tracks. You don't know the half of it, Sandra, Jackie began. Your dad's lawyer has video showing your stepfather receiving a check from your grandfather as payment to break up your parents' marriage. If successful, he would manage your grandparents' finances for a three-annual fee. How do you know this is true, Sharon asked. And who are you? Mom, she's dad's fiancé and a master researcher. Her name is Jackie Stoddard. I trust her more than you, Sandra said firmly. Sharon's face went ashen. Her daughters were distancing themselves from her and there was nothing she could do. Jackie speaks the truth, Sharon, I explained. I ordered my lawyer to release all the video and audio tapes to the FBI, including a letter from your father admitting he paid for the recordings. Your father's hatred for me was so great he didn't care about the cost or who he used to get what he wanted. Is this true? Sharon asked Arnold. Seeing his expression, she knew it was. Sharon realized what she had lost when I divorced her, the only man who truly loved her. Jackie, a word of advice. Don't let others manipulate you like I did, Sharon said. Paul, I want to talk to you alone after the surgery. Right now, I need to go home and reflect. Sandra, will you walk with me to my car? I'll be back soon. Mom and I need to settle a few things. Jackie, watch over Dad till I return, Sandra said. We watched them leave. Sharon held it together until she exited, then started to cry. Both Jackie and I understood she had no idea what had been done until now. Arnold, born with a silver spoon, was paralyzed by fear. The truth had come out and their life was shattered. Sharon would never trust him again. Paul, I dreaded this day. I thought you'd never return. If we had met accidentally, I could have brushed it off, Arnold stated. I never saw this happening. It's best I leave and say no more. He left, leaving us alone. I looked at Jackie, making her blush for the first time. I was looking at her the way a man in love should. For once I was opening myself up. Was she playing me? Was she finally admitting her true feelings? Did I love her as a friend or something more? Either way, my daughters had awakened me. I'd been living in others' shadows, finding joy in their excitement instead of creating my own. Jackie, we have a lot to discuss while I'm in recovery, I said softly. These last few days have awakened me. I got complacent, settling for the sidelines instead of being in the game. Paul, when I got divorced, you stepped in. My kids were still young. You've been more of a dad to them than their own father. From baseball games to father-daughter dances, you've always been there for us. You were always there. I know why you pay me more than the usual rate you want to ensure the kids in your heart are looked after, Jackie said. On their birthdays, you always went overboard, making them the envy of their friends. During summer breaks, you took us on special trips, creating lifelong memories. You answer their questions like a father should. They love you and you love them. Your only problem is your fear of commitment. I tried to speak but couldn't. Jackie was right, and her words hit me hard, as did Sandra's. I walked over to Jackie and sat beside her, taking her hand. I looked into her eyes, gathering my thoughts. Sharon cheated on me. Her father's power intimidated me. My best friend betrayed me. I lived with an ongoing threat on my life. I put myself in protection mode until a few days ago. I didn't realize it. Now that I have, can we go on our first actual date, or is it too late for you and me? I asked. Took you long enough, you old fool, Jackie said before kissing me. I'm texting our kids to tell them we're now a couple and working things out. Pretty sure of yourself, I said, smiling. I texted Sandra, thanking her and asking if everything was okay. Sandra responded, Mom didn't know. She's taking it hard. Won't be back tonight. Let Susan know. Jackie and I went up to Susan's room. After introducing Jackie as my girlfriend... We told her what had happened earlier and showed her Sandra's text. We had just finished when my sister Barbara entered. I just had to meet her, Barbara said. Jackie, what are you doing here? I wanted to say something, but Barb figured it out. He finally clued in, didn't he? She said with a smile. Took him long enough. Susan, this is your Aunt Barbara, and the man entering is your Uncle Lou, Barbara's husband, I said. You'll soon learn we speak our minds like it or not. I excused myself and went to the nurse's station, texting Sandra to ask about Susan's pizza preferences. 
She replied that Susan likes everything but anchovies. I ordered three extra-large pizzas and three two-liter colas for quick delivery. I also called Dad, asking him to bring Mom up in 30 minutes for a pizza party. We pushed the no-eating for eight hours rule but got carried away. The head nurse came in to calm us down but left with a slice of pizza. Later, she stopped me and said, Your actions lifted the spirits of the whole floor. I can't thank you enough. At 400 a.m., they took me and my mom to prepare for the operation. We supported each other until we were wheeled in. I stayed awake until the medication kicked in. When I awoke, it was done. Now came the waiting and praying. Dr. Proctor informed everyone that the bone marrow transfer went well, but it would take a few hours to see if it took. It did. Hearing this, most of the family started preparing to go home. Jackie, I said, is the worst patient ever. But I'm not sick, I replied. You're like a bull in a china shop, impatient, unruly, and miserable. Keep it up and you'll get a bad reputation, Jackie told me. Jackie said my mother was doing well. Once she was sure I was stable, she gave me my phone back. The first texts I saw were from Jackie's kids, both asking, When does she get her engagement ring, Dad? When do we meet our new sisters? Jackie, your kids are smart, I said, showing her the phone. I told them I was coming to watch over you after the operation. They had a lot of questions and the whole story came out. They weren't surprised. They said, Mom, he's always treated us like his own. Most of our friends wish their dads were like him. We've always seen him as our dad, Jackie explained. She read the note and looked at me with tears in her eyes. I guess we'll have a short engagement, I said with a smile. Have you heard from the twins? Sandra and her mother are with Susan. She's doing well considering everything. Even though she's still medicated, she's asking a lot of questions, Jackie disclosed. Sandra told her about the pizza party. Susan can't get over how much she looks like her aunt and grandmother. She can't wait for a girl's day out with them when she recovers. Find me my pants. I want to see her myself and then check on mom, I said. The nurses tried to stop me, saying it was too soon after surgery, but I insisted. So off we went holding hands. Surprisingly, my pain was manageable. Jackie and I noticed Susan's improvement immediately. Her complexion was better and the sparkle in her eyes almost brought tears to mine. Who are Tammy and Timothy Stoddard? Sandra asked. My children, ages 13 and 11. Why? Jackie replied. I got a Facebook friend request from them this morning. So did Susan, Sandra said. You both need to read what they sent me, I said, handing Sandra my phone. She read it, smiled, and passed it to Susan. I want this back to add their phone numbers to my contacts, I said. Sharon then asked if she could talk to me privately, so we went to the waiting room. Paul, I had a long talk with my mother last night. She admitted remembering Dad's hate towards you, but never expected this. My daughters want to finish the school year here and then live with you. They want their last name changed to yours and feel what Arnold and I did is unforgivable, Sharon disclosed. I can't argue with them. They made it clear they'll go to court if I refuse. They no longer trust me, and I can't blame them. Will you let them come? You know my family, they wouldn't let me refuse no matter how I felt. I will gladly take them, so will Jackie. We'll just need a bigger place. I'll drop the suit against you, I said. If you agree to joint custody, I replied, the suit will still go forward against the rest of your family. The twins are old enough to decide the rest. Sharon agreed to joint custody. I offered to pay for their name change, but she declined. We walked back into Susan's room together, the girls watching us intently. Jackie, it looks like we're going to need at least a six-bedroom house, I said. Jackie smiled and the girls screamed with delight. Sharon said, Girls, your father and I agree you get your wishes. If Jackie agrees, I'll call the lawyer tomorrow to start the legal process for your name change. Paul, Jackie asked, are you ready for this a house with teenage kids? No one is ever ready, but we adapt. I'm just getting used to the idea of two carrying my name, I said. Make that four. Tammy and Tim want you to adopt them. They're already signing their names as Carlson, Jackie said. Call Roger Mouser's firm to start the paperwork. Then text the kids to let them know our plans. Let's find out which area has the best schools so we know where to look for our new home, I said. Sandra picked up her phone, opened her contacts, and made a call on speaker. Hello, Tammy said. Who are you and what do you want? 
This is Sandra, your soon Toby older sister. Is Timothy with you? Sandra explained. Can you prove it? Dad taught us not to take calls or messages from unknown sources without proof. Seriously, are you scamming me? Tammy asked. Tammy, Paul and I are getting married, Jackie said. You were talking to Paul's daughter, Sandra. We're all going to be Carlson's. Susan and I are changing our last names and your dad and I have started the process for him to adopt you and change your names to Carlson too, Sandra added. Sweet, let dad know it's about time. How is Susan? Timothy replied. We've been waiting to hear. Jackie and I exchanged a look, witnessing the first conversation of our blended family. She squeezed my hand in support. I am improving, Susan said. So far, so good. I'll text you both so you can add my number. Susan, Sandra, our dad is the only father we've known. Our biological dad was gone before we knew him. Your dad has been better than any of our friend's parents. Mom's been in love with him for a long time. When we get together, we need you to accept that we're all siblings, nothing more, nothing less. Tammy and I won't let anything come between them, Timothy said firmly. Both of my daughters agreed. Jackie, with tear-filled eyes, said, They're showing your morals and standards. You should be proud. They took your values to heart. I was. We said goodbye for now and headed to see my mom. Dad was with her when we walked in, taking them by surprise. My dad saw a look from Jackie that made him smile. He knew something was up. Mom, I said, you're up and about already. Have you seen Susan? How does she look? Her complexion is improving and her spirits are up, so it's looking good. But it's still too early to tell, I replied. We need to have a serious talk if you both have the time. We're not going anywhere, so let's do it, my dad responded. Susan and Sandra will live with me after the school year. They'll change their last name to ours, I said. Sharon agreed to joint custody and the name change. It was the twins' idea. That's wonderful, both my parents said. That's not all, Jackie added. Your son has decided to make an honest woman out of me. Elizabeth, are you ready to help plan a wedding? My mom got teary-eyed and my dad had a big smile. They didn't have to say they approved we knew. I will be adopting Tammy and Timothy and they will take my last name also. Jackie and I will start house hunting as soon as we get back, I added. What got your head out of your back? My dad asked. We all knew how you both felt about each other. I've been trying to get your mother's approval to knock some sense into you. Earl Carlson, behave yourself. You're not at the yard selling a car, Mom said. Jackie, have you thought about your wedding plans? We haven't discussed it much, but since we're blending three families, it should be a family affair. Barb can be my maid of honor, Paul's best man, his brothers-in-law as ushers, Susan and Sandra as bridesmaids, Tammy as the flower girl, and Timothy as the ring bearer. Dad, will you walk me down the aisle with my father? Jackie said with a grin. Depends on who's paying the bill, and if the 19th hole is stocked with Jack Daniels, Dad replied laughing. What do you think, Paul? Jackie asked. It's perfect. It will unite us all. If that's what you want, let's do it, I replied. Should we invite Sharon? Both my parents firmly said no. Mom, Dad, in the next few weeks the media will reveal a lot. I'm suing the federal government, Sharon's parents, and her husband. I believe Sharon was as much a victim as I was. I paid the price years ago, I said. And now Sharon is paying in ways we can only imagine, I continued. She thinks she's lost her daughters forever. Inviting her might help the twins in her forge a new relationship and move on from the past. Jackie and my parents looked at me in awe. Where did that wisdom come from? My dad asked. Seriously, these last few days have taught me a lot, I replied, holding Jackie's hand. Sandra's arrival made me grasp life again. We returned to my room, and I quickly fell asleep, exhausted from the surgery. Jackie stayed by my side and watched the news. Christopher McCormick and Arnold Press had been arrested for lying to the FBI. The person behind the contract on my life had turned state's evidence. My lawyer released details of my firing from the FBI, prompting an internal review. When I woke up, Jackie filled me in. Dr. Proctor informed us that my mother and I would be released the next day. You'll need follow-ups and to get your stitches removed, he said. Susan is doing better than expected. The big question is how she'll respond as she's weaned off her meds. We talked to my parents, who decided not to leave the city until Susan was on the road to recovery.
they would fly back with us on the private plane. Dad booked into the same hotel as Jackie, and the bus driver was instructed to head back over the next few days. The media exposed the deception, backstabbing, and political deals that ruined my marriage and career. They spent a day discussing how Sharon's father manipulated her into believing the rumors and lies. Sharon was publicly dissected like a frog. Jackie and I were headed to visit Susan one last time before going home. Dr. Proctor proudly said she was on the road to a full recovery. Someone must have disliked the negative press about the Fed's past dealings with me because the security release my publisher and I were waiting for was granted. Over a million hard copies would be released to the market within two weeks. I had two first editions delivered overnight. After I signed them, Jackie wrapped them and we hid them in a shopping bag. We made sure Sandra would be there when we entered Susan's room. Your dad and I have set the wedding date for the first weekend in August. Aunt Barbara will be my maid of honor. I was wondering if you two would be my bridesmaids, Jackie asked. Susan exclaimed, hell yes. Jackie, when I first walked into dad's office, I was scared stiff. You recognized me immediately and said, you must be Sharon's daughter. It stunned me. You accepted me from day one. I will proudly be in your wedding party if you'll allow me to call you mom. I watched as the three of them hugged. It was wonderful to see Susan literally jump out of bed. When things settled down, I pulled out the gifts and handed them each a signed first edition of my book with the message to one of the two prettiest ladies who call me dad. With love, Jason Blackstone or Paul Earl Johnson. Susan was ecstatic when she unwrapped it. It was my biggest book yet, over 600 pages. Her face glowed with pride, knowing it wasn't released yet. She flipped open the cover, saw my note, and then lost it. Dad, you've already done so much. I didn't need this, she sobbed, running into my arms. Before you came into my life, the hospital staff said I had only a few days left. Sandra knew it too. I don't know why she went into the attic, but I'm glad she did because it brought us you. She hugged me tightly, and Sandra watched us for a few seconds. Dad, you should know Dr. Proctor believes if Susan had only gotten one transplant, it wouldn't have worked. The double transplant shocked her body into responding. In the last six days, she's gained 10 pounds, Sandra explained. I didn't know if you would come, but you didn't hesitate. You brought a tribe. Thanks to the family, I'm getting my best friend back. How's your mom holding up? I asked, trying to change the tone. She's filed for divorce and is going to therapy to deal with a lifetime of lies. She now understands what you went through and is ashamed, Susan said. She says only someone who has experienced it can understand that it's a living hell. Her work and friends are her support. Mom is strong and will get through it. The key will be getting her to trust again. Right now, she doesn't know who or what to believe. Sandra, even with family support, it can take years to regain trust. It requires an unexpected act of faith. For me, it was Sandra walking through my office door. I said, thank God you did. Paul had me believing I'd die an old maid waiting for him, Jackie added with humor. Now, girls, stand by your father so I can capture a few photos. The best one will be an 8x10 for his desk. When we stepped off the plane, we were surprised by Jackie's parents and children there to greet us. The kids nearly knocked me down with their excitement, which spread to all of us. My dad enjoyed hearing them call me dad. I realized Timothy would have two older sisters and one younger, just like me. Tammy hugged my mom and said, I'm glad you're becoming my grandmother. I reflected on how quickly my life was changing with unexpected blessings. Jackie and I decided to shove our pre-Sandra plans until after the wedding. Jackie knew our needs, so I let her handle finding a new home. This gave me time to write my first fiction book. My previous works exposed corruption and cover-ups. We stayed in touch with the twins and Jackie found a 20-acre property with a barn needing repair. Susan was improving and returned to school part-time. We had a firm design our house with steel and brick, including an outdoor kitchen, large patio, pool, and a four-bay garage. Jackie's reduced office time let me work harder with an editor from my publisher helping. I wrote over 300 pages, publishing my first book under my real name. Sharon used my lawyer to divorce Arnold securing alimony and education costs. 
My cases were in mediation as they lost the will to fight. Tammy, Timothy, Jackie, and I awaited the twins' arrival after their last school day. Timothy saw them driving up our new driveway. We all went outside to greet them. As they stepped out of the Explorer, I realized Susan's recovery was so remarkable I couldn't tell her from Sandra. Jackie whispered, we'll figure it out. Timothy, playing big brother, carried their luggage as Jackie showed off the house. In my office, three copies of my latest book, Unexpected Blessings, sat on my desk. It was a fictionalized story of us.